Okay, so our weather basics video, uh, number one. Uh, one cubic foot of water heated to a pressure of 60 to 70 PSIG. That's the same energy as one pound of gunpowder. That's a key point to keep in mind. Anytime you deal with steam water systems, there's a lot of energy you're dealing with. As long as energy is contained, you're okay. But it can be a catastrophic failure if this energy gets loose. We have a two drum boiler, kind of a cartoonish drawing. Um, have the steam drum, down comers, mud drum, risers, and it's just a basic circulation. There's no superheater, no economizers on this drawing. Um, basically, your steam drum contains a supply of water. You add your feed water, as it is colder than the water in the drum usually, it'll help increase the density of the water. Uh, it drops down the mud drum. It's called the mud drum because in the old days you used to get a lot of particulate sludge built up down here. We have our blow down valves. The way this works, as your water is heated, it starts forming steam bubbles. So it gets up here, you have a steam water mix, which is a lot lighter than the water, the downcomer, so it creates a circulation. Uh, the length of tube here is important too to increase circulation. And at higher loads, you have more steam bubbles in the mix and it flows quicker. Uh, the steam water mix is captured and it feeds up to a, we use a cyclone separator on this drawing. You probably wouldn't see it in a 250 pound boiler. A lot of times they'll use screens. Um, they have some way in here to separate the steam and the water mixture. That's the whole key of this part of the steam drum is to try and dry the steam all you can, get rid of all the water droplets. Uh, the cyclone separator, it spins the mixture. The water's flung, the outside drains out, steam comes up to center. It goes to the Chevron dryer screens. This creates a torturous path where the water droplets stick to the plates and then drain off. Up here, I have another set of dryer screens. These can go across the boiler. Uh, their whole purpose of these is to dry the steam, get rid of any moisture droplets. Up here, we have a non-return valve. It's a check valve with a gag on, hand wheel gag. Keeps any steam from coming back in the boiler, which could be a catastrophic failure. And we have a pressure gauge, maintaining, watching the pressure on the boiler. The heart of these natural circulation type boilers has uh, a difference in densities in the water in the steam water mix. Um, you have several types of boiling. You have nucleate boiling, small steam bubbles form along the sides of the tubes. Uh, they're in the water mix. So you have a lot of little bubbles, good heat transfer with this type. This is what you want to see. Departure from nucleate boiling, starting to get sheets, larger voids. Uh, this is from over firing the boiler. You're starting to lose some tube cooling. Then you have film boiling. <clears throat> That's getting sheets of steam forming on the tubes. Uh, you're losing a lot of cooling as this is kind of insulation here. High heat loads. Somehow you've lost flow in the tubes or firing's too hard. Um, the critical point is another key part of this. At 3202, 3206, and 3204, we got 3199 PSIG. Uh, it's somewhere in there. You have a critical point. That's where your steam and water have the same density and there's really no latent heat of evaporation. So one pound of water has the same density as one pound of steam. Uh, Supercritical boilers don't really have drums, just have pipes, lines. The steam and water, they form right here, just phase change. Um, in the metric, it'd be 373 degrees Celsius at 2,260 kilopascals. A 250 PSI boiler, the steam is at 406 degrees, and one pound of steam occupies 1.8 cubic feet. If you drop the pressure, a uh, sudden load increase, somebody took a lot more steam, charging a steam line, uh, whatever the issue is. If it drops to 200 PSI, your steam temperature will drop to 381, and you have 2.3 cubic feet per pound of steam. So you have 20 four percent more volume even some of the water in here may start flashing the steam as the pressure drops you get more bubbles in here bubbles get a lot larger in here and your drum level is going to rise um, it shows a 250 psi smaller steam bubbles if you drop this to 200 steam bubbles become a lot larger you have a lot more volume so as your load increases uh, the pressure drops and the drum level will rise the problem with this, the drum level rises. When your pressure comes back to 250, it's gonna drop like a rock. So if you have a high level and you cut the feed water, 
Now it's really going to be low when it comes back. So you basically do the opposite of what the water level shows. If you see a high increase, you start adding more feed water. The opposite occurs if you drop load. Let's say somebody shuts a valve, loses a piece of equipment, um, steam flow drops, your pressure comes up. Load decreases, the pressure increases, and the level drops. Your steam bubbles become smaller, they get squeezed. At this point, your drum level is going to drop. Your feed water valve is going to try to open, or you're going to try and put more water in. And when you get back to normal, now the pressure comes back, now it's going to be high. Um, a single element drum level control only looks at level. It's fairly unstable. And these kind of problems you're going to see. As soon as this level goes high, it's going to shut down the flow. You're going to get back to normal, and all of a sudden the pressure comes up, and now you're going to really drop. The three element, it looks at steam and feed water flows. Uh, it tries to balance the steam flow with the feed water flows. It's a forward-looking type controller. Uh, it corrects with the drum level. It's a lot more stable. If it sees a high steam flow increase, it's going to kick up the feed water and then it'll correct the drum level. It takes a lot of this swing and problems out. Um, the saturated steam, the more heat added, more water is converted to steam. There's no temperature increase. Uh, that's a latent heat of evaporation. So if you fire this harder and the pressure stays at 250, you're just going to make more steam. The temperature still be 406 degrees. The only way to superheat is to get the steam away from the water. Then you can add more heat to the steam that way. Okay, the most important part of this whole thing, the one thing that everybody really, really needs to understand, if water level is unknown, shut fuel off. Do not add water. Um, this has killed more people than about anything with boilers. So if you walk up to a boiler, this is all red. You don't know where the sight glass is. I uh, just walked up to it, trip it, shut the fuel off. Um, adding water to this thing could cause an explosion. <clears throat> you have to maintain water chemistry. That is huge. You need to know the pH in these, um, conductivity. pH is just critical. If you get the pH down to the low sevens, you will do a lot of damage to a boiler fairly quickly, especially with any oxygen in the water. I need to follow the chemistry requirements the manufacturer, uh, the plant, something that has to be checked and paid attention to. And you need accurate instrumentation too to maintain it. Uh, you need to start it from manufacturer directions. These smaller boilers are really easy to get on the fuel when you fire them up. If you have natural gas or diesel oil, uh, you can run them pretty hard. It's not so bad on the tubes. It's your heavy drums, your steam drum and mud drums are thicker metal. It can cause a lot of stress on them to heat them too fast. So you need to follow manufacturer's recommendations. I know a lot of times there's a big hurry to fire these up, get the plant started or whatever you're doing with these boilers. But you still need to maintain the start recommendations to minimize damage to them. One thing you don't want to do is over fire. It's really easy to over fire these things. If it's rated 10,000 pounds and you need 13, you'll run it a lot harder. The problem is you get higher steam flows and your steam separation equipment isn't designed for higher flow, so you maybe get quite a bit of moisture carryover. Also, if you run these at 200 pounds pressure instead of 250 or whatever, you run your boil at lower pressure, you have more steam flow. Like there's 24% more volume at 200 than 250. At that point, you're pushing a lot more steam through the system than it's designed for, and you may get moisture carryover. It's not a huge problem if you get really clean water, but you can carry over and it's going to drop out in the superheater tubes. You're going to coat your superheater tubes and damage those. So it's really a good idea to follow manufacturer design. Uh, run at the firing maximum firing level they recommend and at the pressure they recommend. Changing these two will cause problems for the boiler. I really like the bicolor glasses. You can see these a long ways away. Um, there's no question of where the level is. <clears throat> you walk up on these. A lot of times they're dirty. It's hard to see the level. Um, these, there's no question. It's a little better deal for operators. <laughs> when it comes to draining the boiler, you open the first off valve first, and then you throttle with the second valve. Let the second valve take all the beating. And the same thing, you close the second valve first, and then close the 
valve close to the boiler. That way you keep one valve that's in good shape. Once you start cutting the seat on these valves, it'll keep cutting and destroy itself. I know sometimes people open, they'll do different things. You know, open this first and this guy's second, next guy comes along, does the opposite. Pretty soon you get both these valves screwed up. Now you got a boiler drains that are tearing up the valves and losing water. Uh, the blowdowns, if you have a quick opening valve, it's a hand valve, you open lever, you open that fast. And then the seatless valve, you crank this open, uh, wait a couple seconds and then close it again. This depends on the size of the boiler, how long you blow down, kind of what the manufacturer recommends. Uh, if this opens too long, you can lose circulation in these tubes, some on small boilers, which will get you back into this kind of a state and overheating tubes. <clears throat> Um, refractor, bicolor sight glass, it works on refractive index. There's a red and a green piece of glass in these usually of light source. Sends the two beams out. It goes through the sight glass, these lenses. This one shows water. It reflects the green light out here. The red light curves down. And if it's, it's all steam, the steam, the red light comes through, and the water curves down. There's a little different designs on how these work, but basically it's just the refractive index, two different colors of light coming through it, and how they react in the water determines um, what's going to show. These are really nice because even if the glass gets dirty, you can still see the colors on it. One thing we're mentioning is not really part of a boiler. Now it's a Jurgensen safety ball check valve. These are really handy for uh, chemical plants or chemical tanks. If you had this on an ammonia vessel, the way they work, if the sight glass breaks, this ball check is slammed into this seat and then it stops the flow. You got one on both sides of the sight glass, top and bottom. Um, when you put these in service, you open the top bell about a quarter turn and the bottom one about a quarter turn. This little pin here keeps the ball from jamming into the seat. Then once your sight glass is normal level, you, you open them all the way up. If you open this all the way up like a regular sight glass, this ball will slam into the seat here. And you may show a level in here, whereas the level's way up here. Um, if this valve does get ball slammed shut, you just crank this back in, a little pin pushes the ball back, let the levels equalize, and then go ahead and open it back up. Uh, these are not for boiler use, but they are handy for a lot of plant chemistry. And people aren't aware of this, they'll go ahead and open this up quickly. The ball slams in here, they're showing a level down here. They think the sight glass is in service and it's really not. But they're really good for um, a lot of chemical vessels and things like that that are hazardous materials. They work quite well. Okay, we got some samples here of valve damage. Um, this is part of a Stellite seat valve. Um, as you can see, it's been pretty well destroyed. It was steam water cut. It's amazing that it has this much energy to do this. There's nothing left of the ceiling surface on this valve. Here's the body. As you can see, it's substantial damage. Uh, cut through the stellite seat. This valve sat in here like this. As you open it, it pulled down. Anyhow, pretty well destroyed this valve. That's why once these valves start leaking through, they get cut. That's the end of the valve. Uh, when you start a plant up, it's a good idea to take a heat gun out just to make sure valves aren't leaking. Sometimes you can tighten them down a little bit more and prevent this kind of damage. That's why you use one valve for sealing and one valve is used for throttling the flows. Here's another valve that had a started leaking out the side of it. As you can see, it has substantial erosion damage on the upstream side of the seat. I don't know if the valve wasn't closed right, leaking through a little bit, but it cut all cut through the valve body. It didn't hurt the seat on this one, so it must be a little bit lower pressure. Another valve, this one here is pretty well starting to be damaged. You can see right there it's cut through pretty good. Um, they get like that, there's nothing to do for it. That's why it's so important to make sure valves 
are closed correctly. Um, once they start leaking, it's a matter of time before they have to be replaced. One thing we've had a lot of questions about is backseating high pressure steam valves. And a lot of the valves are designed to be backseated. So high pressure steam valves on the 2400 PSI stuff, you will backseat them. Um, it protects the packing in the valves, but check the manufacturer's recommendations. Some are actually designed to be used that way. This is a quick opening valve. I want a Yarways manual. Shows a lever. Uh, there's a plug that comes across the opening. This is your first blow off valve. And the purpose of this is to provide a sealing valve. Opens quickly. Uh, do not blow down this. It slams the water too fast down the piping, cause water hammer. This is a second, the seatless blow down valve. There's a plunger in the center. Uh, you open that up and there's some sealing strips. This allows a little more controlled flow. This one's fully open and then you fully close it. The length of time to open depends on the size of the boiler, how much you're blowing down. But you can't leave it open too long and start losing circulation in the boiler. These are all Yarways valve manuals. They have some really good reference material.